Well, welcome in the name of Christ. Now, there's a... As, as y'all know... Yes, a big one. Um, as y'all know, today is my birthday. Today is my birthday. And um, what I'd like you to do, them that are uh, over 60, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take out a sheet of paper and I would like to, you to write down all the perks I now get from different places. You know, yes, if it's a long list, that's even better. Of things I get free, you know, now that I'm over 60. Now, I will tell you, I was over at Two Ridges, and you all may not know this, this is a, a special Ohio deal, a special Ohio law. I took advantage of my first perk today. You see, on Ohio State Road, when you're over 60, you can drive with your blinker on the whole time. You can, you can also back up out at any public parking lot without looking behind you. Because the young people better just watch what you're doing. So, so write that down, but, but uh, yeah, birthday, and thank you to my, my sweet wife who... Uh, is dressed much younger than me, actually much younger than she is right now. <laughs> well, we've got announcements in the bulletin of which you better, you, uh, better take note. You better take note of them. Uh, the, uh, also, we have a new life here, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, would you, would you, Mr. Brother Russell, would you introduce your daughter? And, and we've got grandparents that are kind of proud, right? Just a little bit, just a little proud, right? And, and what is, uh, what I think is absolutely incredible, and we live in a wonderful world. When is Riley's birthday? Uh, it was on Thursday. It was on Thursday, and she's here this morning. Wow. That's pretty impressive to me. And she already knows her numbers and shapes, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is, so sometime before you leave, Take a, take a look at, at Riley. I will tell you she is really cute, unlike some babies that are drop-down ugly. Uh, but <laughs> she is like my cousin. Uh, she is really, really cute. So, are there any other announcements? Uh, we, got a, we got a hot dog dinner, uh, luncheon, uh, next, after church next week, so you want to take note of that. Uh, Debbie, what... It's that speaker, it's the speakers. The popping is coming from the speakers. 
Yeah, I don't know. Okay, good, good. And could we have a show of hands of everybody who will eat the cookies? <laughs> okay, there you go. That's good. And, yes, Debbie. Outstanding. And Linda? Yeah, but I just want to remind all the deacons that we have a meeting tomorrow at 6.30. Okay. So please attend. Okay. Deacon meeting tomorrow at 6.30. Who's bringing the cards? And the, and the chips? Okay, good. Brothers and sisters, as God's people, let's worship Him together. the theme for the service. Let's sing together. It'll be up on the, the screen here. Let there be peace on earth.
You all may be seated. In just a little bit, we're going to hear God's Word read and proclaimed. But before we get to that part of the service, we're going to uh, have an opportunity to lift our prayers to God. <laughs> Dale, you're really intimidating right here. <laughs> We're, now, part of the prayer will be confession as we, we get ourselves ready to hear God's Word. Then we'll have a time of silence so that you can lift your own prayers to God. And we'll close by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Before we do that, though, are there any particular needs or concerns that anybody might have? So we want to lift up Jim Durst. Thank you. Yes, fine. Uh, my neighbor, Linda Heaton. Linda Heaton. Is in bad condition. She had, she's up there in age two, you know, um, like in her 70s. She lives across the street from me. And uh, she had, had to put her in St. Clairsville home for a while for rehabilitation. She broke both of her legs and some stuff, other stuff going on with her. And they put her in St. Clairsville in her home okay. to get her rehabilitated. So I'm praying for her to get rehabilitated back to health. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Yes? We have to acknowledge the fact how sick Greg was just a few days ago. Well, you know, I was going to mention that. Uh, Greg, I don't know which is more amazing, that a baby could be born on Thursday uh, or th and be here on Sunday morning, or a man can have a heart attack on Tuesday. Tuesday and be here on Sunday morning. So, yes, Greg, it's wonderful that you're... What's that? In body as well as spirit. In body as well as spirit. That's right. You know, not just the spirit hovering around. Uh, so, yes, and he looks so good, you know, for, for what he's going through. Thank people who provided the prayers for me. Much appreciated. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, but it's good to see y'all. And uh, the, nice to meet you too. So, anybody else? Anything else we need? Yes, Chaffee. Yeah, I've got a friend, Jeffrey, who's suffering from cancer. He's missing just two months left. Oh. But, uh, blessings and prayers for his family. Jeff? Jess. Jess Reed. Yeah, and you married his son. Oh, okay. Okay. Cancer. Okay. We left out the family then in our prayer. Thank you. Any, anything else? I don't want to embarrass Donna, who just walked in, because she's very shy. And it would be really embarrassing if, if everybody looked at her. So please don't look at Donna. Yeah, don't do what Shirley's doing, you know, for Donna. Okay? Yeah. All right. <laughs> then let's go. Let's go to God now in prayer. And I'll open, I'll pray for a little bit. Then you all have the opportunity to lift your prayers to God and we'll close with the Lord's Prayer. So let's go to God now in prayer. Lord God, before we say anything else, we've got to thank you for giving us a wonderful, beautiful day. In fact, you've given us a pretty good weekend. Uh, we thank you for the weather yesterday and the, the concert and all the community activities. We thank you for the weather today and we thank you most of all for your presence and your grace that flows all around us. We, we give you great thanks and praise. Now, in a little bit, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, peace and as we prepare ourselves... Uh, for that, uh, there's something that uh, we need to, uh, well, we need to confess. We need to get off our chest. You see, sometimes we see peace, the peace, your peace, the peace we're called to experience in our life as something that is temporary. It, it comes and, and it goes. Uh, when it's here, that's nice, but other times we've got to put it aside and get down to, uh, to business. Uh, we don't live in that peace all the time. And, and since your word doesn't say that peace is, is temporary, that's transitional, or, uh, we're sorry that we don't claim a peace that is more, more permanent. And so we ask, we, we ask for your forgiveness. We also ask that you enable us to experience a peace that, that doesn't fail, that continues. 
We ask this in the name of Christ. And now in the privacy of our own hearts, we're going to lift up to you all the needs that, that we've heard. We're going to lift up to you the concerns that are in the uh, bulletin on the insert. And we're going to lay before you those things that weigh heavy on our heart. Lord God, hear us as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for listening to us. And of course, thank you for loving us. But right now, we thank you for forgiving us, which we believe you have, and for responding to our needs, and we believe you will, because we've confessed these sins and laid these needs before you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you all come on out front to collect our offering? things that I didn't mention before when we were praying, but you might want to note. Uh, Richie, 
you know, our buddy Richie Marshall, he, he had another little stroke and he is down at Brightwood in Fallensby, so we want to uh, lift him up in our prayers. Our sister Karen Edwards had surgery this last week. You know, she has kidney issues. If that weren't bad enough, she took a fall, did damage to her shoulder, had surgery. Good news is not only did they fix it, but they had planned on her going to rehab for a couple of weeks and they said that's not necessary. So she was able to go home. So, so that is a, certainly a good news. And, and uh, Sister Torrance, would you, now I want you to pretend like you're a Pentecostal. Okay, you ready? You're going to pretend like you're Pentecostal. Raise your hand. Look at those things on her hand. You know. She's got one, one broken wrist. She's got one broken finger. And she is still playing the organ. So I think that's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, I am both impressed and a little bit scared. I am never going to mess with you. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together and, and bless us as we go about your work. Guide and direct the leaders of this congregation that these gifts may be put to good and effective use. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Well, we are now on week four of our summer series. And it's a series that uses uh, a, a couple of verses, a little passage of Paul's letter to the Galatians to better understand how we might go about living by the Holy Spirit. That's what we've been talking about. And I thought, given the fact that we are on the edge of Independence Day, I thought some symbol of America would be appropriate for the bulletin cup. And so that's why I picked what I picked, but I'll explain how I'm going to use it in just a little bit. Now, like I said, this is the fourth uh, message in a, a bigger series. Therefore, before getting into anything new, I want to uh, spend just a tiny bit of time talking about what we've already covered. I mean, in the first message, we sort of talked about what not to do, something Paul calls the desires of the flesh, you know, the, the bad stuff we're supposed to avoid. That was the topic in the first week. During the second week, we talked about how love is both a decision and an obligation. And then last week, we talked about joy, the feeling, not the person and how it was grounded in faith, how it, how it strengthens those who are suffering, and how it's shared, must be shared, among Christians. Now, that's what we've done to this point, kind of in a nutshell. And this morning, we're going to look at the third fruit of the Spirit, namely, peace. And this past week, as I was thinking about how we might introduce this, on the Sunday before the 4th, I thought about something I had read oh, a couple of years ago about the eagle on the presidential seal. Now, I, I got to tell you, I don't remember where I heard it, may have read it, I'm not sure, but it had to do with the direction the eagle faces when the country goes to war. You see, when everything is peaceful, at least this is what I, what I heard, when everything is peaceful, the eagle faces the olive branch, the universal symbol of peace. Now, this means that it looks exactly the same as it does on the great seal of the United States. But when the country is at war, the, the eagle on the presidential seal turns and faces the arrows. Of course, this only happens during times of conflict. At least that's what I heard a couple of years ago. And I'll tell you, as I thought about it, this eagle with his head turning from one direction to the other, it, it struck me that that is sort of the way we see peace. 
and I don't care what kind of peace you're talking about. I mean, when things are all calm and all serene and all tranquil, which means obviously you don't have a teenager living in your house, when everything is nice and dandy, we can focus our attention on, on things like olive branches, right? And on doves and, and on that groovy symbol from the 60s. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about my birthday. I'm talking about the 1960s. Now, that's, that's the direction we face. When we, and when we think about it, that's when things are just about as chill as they can possibly be. And we feel good about it, right? That's when we focus on peace. But of course, there's the other side of the coin, right? And I'm talking about when things get really stirred up. And there's a lot of anger and a lot of hostility in the room. And we've read tweet tweets about being psychos, right? And as being dumb as a rock. And, or having a bleeding face left. Which, by the way, I got to tell you, I know is an insult, but I really don't understand it. So somebody needs to explain it to me later. My gosh, when that kind of thing happens, we are now what? At war. Right? And it's all hands on deck. And now I've just about got to tweet about how Cheerios are made for little hands. Brothers and sisters, as a country, we are in big trouble. You see, when this kind of stuff happens, the head of the eagle has turned, hasn't it? Right to the arrows. And peace is no longer an option anymore. Now that sure seems to be the way it is in our world. I mean, peace may be fine, but sometimes you've got to knock a few heads together, right? Peace isn't for all times. Of course, that's what our world tells us, right? But, and I'm talking about our society, the only trouble is that's just not the way it's presented in the Bible. And certainly not in the way Paul used the word peace in his letters, including the one we were looking at, the little passage from Gal the letter to the Galatians. I mean, not only did he offer it without an asterisk and without any qualification on his list of spiritual fruits, he wrote that peace must be a part of Christian living. You know, living by the Holy Spirit. That's just the way it is. And I'll tell you, when we look at what he had to say, he described three areas in which we might need to work a little peace into our characters. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. For example, first for Paul, God has called us to live with peace with ourselves. To live in peace with ourselves. And I'm talking about within ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about inner peace. That's what God wills for us. You see, for him, peace just seems to be the way things are supposed to be. The natural order of the world. It should be peace. And I think that's what he suggested when he wrote to the, to the Corinthians. And in this passage, he was talking about how worship shouldn't you know, become just a free-for-all with people doing anything they wanted. This is what he wrote to the Corinthians. He wrote, let only one person speak at a time. Good idea. Then all of you will learn something and be encouraged. A prophet should be willing to stop and let someone else speak. Okay? God wants everything to be done what? Peacefully and in order. You see, God is a God of peace. He's not a God of confusion and He's not a God of chaos. And for people, as they look into their own lives, this should be clear, especially for those of us who believe our lives and our destinies are in the hands of God, in His loving and merciful hands. I'll tell you, for Paul, knowing that we, have, we will be saved through Jesus Christ should offer us a sense of inner peace. 
that we didn't have before we made that decision to trust. At least that's the way Paul saw it. For instance, I want you to listen to what he wrote to the Philippians. He said, finally, my friends, keep your minds on whatever is true, pure, right, holy, friendly, and proper. Don't ever stop thinking about what is truly worthwhile and worthy of praise. You know the teachings I gave you, and you know what you heard me say and saw me do. So follow my example. And God who gives what? Peace will be with you. And to the Colossians he wrote, Each of you is part of the body of Christ. And you were chosen to live together in peace. So let peace, let the peace that comes from Christ control your thoughts and be grateful. Let the message about Christ completely fill your lives while you use all your wisdom to teach and instruct each other. With thankful hearts sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you say or do should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus as you give thanks to God the Father because of Him. You see, it is God's intention. It's God's intention that we know inner peace, that we are peaceful on the inside. And I'll tell you something, that's not all that different from what Luke wrote. You know, that the uh, angelic host said after the angel had announced the birth of Christ to the shepherds. Remember what the, the host of heaven said? Suddenly many other angels came down from heaven and joined in praising God. They said, praise God in heaven, peace on earth to everyone who pleases God. That we experience inner peace. Inner tranquility, inner serenity. That's the will of God. That's what God wants us to know. And I'll tell you, that's good news for us. And I'll tell you right now why. There's a whole lot of stuff happening in our world and in our country, in our community and in our congregation. My gosh, in our families and even in our own lives that causes us to feel anything but peaceful. And I don't care whether you're talking about problems with children or sicknesses at home or financial reversals. I'll tell you, I think we all run into all kinds of things that keep us stirred up all the time. You know, keep our minds working. And yet when we tap in to that inner spirit of peace that God has planted inside of each one of us, and I'm telling you, He has. And when we consider that not only are we in His hands, but God controls the entire creation, I believe that will calm us down a little bit. We won't feel so stirred up. But more than that, it's going to keep us focused on how we might better conform ourselves to His will and to His work. You see, God created us to be at peace with ourselves. And that's the first area of peace we can know. And second, I think God has also caused us to live at, created us, called us to live at peace with himself. In other words, he's given us the ability and he's given us the opportunity to live in a state of serenity and tranquility with God. We can have peace with God. And I'll tell you, that's really what's driving Paul when he wrote this to the, to the Ephesians. He wrote, Christ has made peace between Jews and Gentiles. He has united us by breaking down the wall of hatred that separated us. Christ gave his own body to destroy the law of Moses with all its rules and commands. He even brought Jews and Gentiles together. Though we were, one, we were only one person when he united us in peace. On the cross, Christ did away with our hatred for one another. He also made peace between us and God by uniting Jews and Gentiles in one body. Christ came and preached preach peace to you, 
Gentiles who were far from God and peace to us Jews who were close to God. And because of Christ, all of us can come to the Father by the same Spirit. You see, for Paul, it was the law that caused all the problems. It was the law that kept us all stirred up, that broke relationship with God, that separated Jews from Gentiles, that separated people from the God who loved them. It was the law. Now that's the way it was. But when Christ died on the cross, He abolished the weight and the power of the law. And without the law telling us what to do, and separating us from those who do and those who don't, now we can have peace not only with one another, but we can also have peace with God. Put another way, living is no longer worrying about making sure all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed. It's about living within the love and the mercy and the grace and the compassion of our Heavenly Father. That's what life is about. It's like he wrote to the Romans. By faith we have been made acceptable to God. And now because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live at peace with God. Christ died for us at a time when we were helpless and sinful. No one is really willing to die for an honest person, though someone might be willing to die for a truly good person. But God showed how much He loved us by having Christ die for us, even though we were sinful. But there's more. Now that God has accepted us because Christ sacrificed His life's blood, we, we will also be kept safe from God's anger. Even when we were God's enemies, He made peace with us because His Son died for us. Yet something even greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, we will be saved by His Son's life. And in addition to everything else, we are happy because God sent our Lord Jesus Christ to make peace with us. You see, it is also God's will that we live in peace with God. And I've got to tell you, that's another message. This really good news for us. Because I'm telling you, there are a lot of sincere and dedicated Christians who seem to believe that peace with God is something that they have to earn. There's something that they have to deserve. You've got to do something to get peace with God. And so they buy into a whole bunch of rules and a whole bunch of regulations. In other words, they build a new set of laws to make themselves right and acceptable. You see, that becomes the, their focus. But I'll tell you, it also becomes their fear. Because they're never sure whether they've done enough. But when we accept that peace with God is His gift to us, this is something He's given to us, not because we deserved it, but because He gave it to us. And whether we accept it or not affects us, but it doesn't affect Him, nor does it affect His relationship with us. All of a sudden, a lot of the pressure we may have felt before eases. And we can enter the world with a new sense of confidence and hope. Why? Because God has already given us the ability to live in peace with Him. And that's the second area of peace we can know. And third, God most definitely, most definitely made us to live in peace with others. In other words, regardless of what we may think, regardless of what we may tell ourselves, there is absolutely no spiritual reason for us to feel hostility to other people, much less animus and hatred. There is no spiritual reason. 
And I think that was the point Paul wanted the Christians in Rome to understand. You see, back in the day, the church there in Rome, and we're talking about 2,000 years ago, they were, and this is going to be hard for you to believe because it just doesn't happen anymore, their church was splitting. Whoa, that doesn't happen nowadays. Now that we have one church and everybody's agreeing and happy. Their church was splitting over an issue that the Roman believers thought was really important. And here it is. Some of the Christians in the Roman church thought you could only eat vegetables. That's all you could eat. And other Christians in the Roman church liked to sit down to a big juicy steak. Right? And they were fighting about it. Now, I know that sounds like small potatoes, no pun intended, to us. But I'm telling you, it was a big deal in the Roman church. In fact, for them, it, is, it was as big a deal as some of the nonsense, and I'm calling it nonsense, that we allow to divide the church nowadays. And to these Christians, who were just doing what Christians tend to do, which means they were fighting with one another and they were scrapping and they were calling one another names and accusing one another of not being true Christians. It was to these Christians that Paul wrote. He said, we must stop judging others. We must also make up our minds not to upset anyone's faith. The Lord Jesus has made it clear to me that God considers all food fit to eat. But if you think some food, foods are unfit to eat, then for you, they are not fit. Now I think if Paul wanted to, he could have written after that line, duh. If you think it's wrong, what? Don't do it. If you are hurting others by the foods you eat, you are not guided by love. Don't let your appetite destroy someone Christ died for. Don't let your right to eat bring shame to Christ. God's kingdom isn't about eating and drinking. It's about pleasing God, about living in peace, and about true happiness. All this comes from the Holy Spirit. If you serve Christ in this way, you will please God and be respected by people. We should try to live at peace and help each other have a strong faith. Wow! We should learn to live at peace with one another so that they can have a strong faith. And to the Ephesians he wrote, always be humble and gentle. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we've lost both of those lately. Humility and gentleness. Always be humble and gentle. Patiently put up with each other and love each other. Debbie's been doing that for years. Try your best to let God's Spirit keep your hearts united. Do this by living at peace. All of you are part of the same body. There is only one Spirit of God, just as you were given one hope when you were chosen to be God's people. That's what he said. And remember what he said in that other passage we read from Ephesians, how God and Christ had already knocked down that wall of hostility that divided Jews and Gentiles so that they could live in peace. You see, God wants us to live in peace with one another. He doesn't want us fighting and scrapping with one another. He wants us to live in peace. And again, that's something we need to remember, especially today. Now, I don't know about y'all, but today, as you know, is my birthday in the 60 years of my life. I can't remember a time when there was so much hostility and so much downright hatred in our country. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it. And I'll tell you, it's filtering into the rest of our society. If you don't believe me, check into Facebook sometime. There's a lot of hostility going on there. <laughs> Doesn't make it any different. You know, it's still there. I guess in a nutshell, 
we don't treat one another very well anymore. We're not courteous. We're not. Heck, we're certainly not sensitive. We assume that we don't have to listen to people who say things different from what we already believe, right? Those are the only people we should listen to because everybody else is a liar and a fake, right? And regardless of the issue, every disagreement, if I have a disagreement with you, it is not disagreeing over an issue. What is it? It's personal, right? That's the world we now live in. And I don't remember seeing it like this before. And in keeping with the result of these assumptions, we blame... Who do we blame for that? We all blame the same person. You know who we blame for that? Them. Right? Am I right? We blame them. It's not us. We had nothing to do with it. We are completely innocent, right? It is whose fault? Their fault. We're surrounded by hostile. No wonder beyond name calling, nothing seems to ever get done. But of course, regardless of who's at fault, that's not important. It's the hostility and the hatred. It's the divisions and the conflict. Man, those are the things that are contrary to the will of God. They just are. Because God wills Peace. And I'll tell you, it's up to us. It's up to us. We who are Christians saved by grace. We who are loved by a God who doesn't deserve, and we don't deserve that love. We who are inspired by a spirit we didn't choose or allow to inspire us. It's up to us. To recognize that through God, those walls that we use to divide have been abolished. And with that clearly in mind, that we can have peace, and it's the will of God to have peace with one another. We need to do whatever is necessary, and I'm talking about in an atmosphere of trust, and trust is always a decision. We decide to trust. It doesn't come naturally. In an atmosphere of trust, to come together and then to roll up our sleeves and get to doing what God has called us to do. And I'll tell you something, there's plenty of that work to be done in our world. I'll tell you, even though it may mean smashing some of the idols that we treasure the most, our own idols, God intends that we live in peace with one another. And that's the third area of peace we can know. And I'm telling you, that's actually in keeping with the eagle on the presidential seat. You see, even though I did a little research on this, even though Woodrow Wilson had turned the head of the eagle towards the arrows in 1916, you remember 1916, I was just a little boy running around? Since 1945, it is pointed in the exact same direction. Hasn't turned at all. And when President Truman issued the executive order that permanently turned the eagle's head, he said, this new flag faces the eagle towards the staff, you know, the pole that holds the flag, which is looking to the front all the time when you are on the march and also has him looking at the olive branch for peace instead of the arrows for war. In other words, President Truman wanted the eagle's gaze to be seen as symbolic. Symbolic of a nation that is always moving forward and symbolic of a nation always dedicated to peace. And that's the way it's been for 70 years the last 70 years. And I'll tell you, that also applies to us. 
You see, as we move forward as Christians, living by the Spirit, God has called us to live in peace. To live in peace within ourselves, to live in peace with Him, and to live at peace with one another. That's what God has called us to do. And brothers and sisters, that's true regardless of the eagle on the presidential seal. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord God, you have called us to live in peace. It's not hard. I mean, this isn't a hard concept to grasp. You've called us, you've created us, you've made us. To experience inner peace. That's why we were made. Being stirred up and angry and full of hatred. That's not your will. And you made us to live in peace with you. Not to be afraid of you or to try to placate you, but rather to be at peace with you. And you certainly made us to live in peace with one another. Lord God, Help us to do what is necessary. Help us to do what is necessary. So that that peace may be experienced. And so that peace may be shared. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Now, before we, we close uh, this uh, uh, service with uh, America the Beautiful... I, I, didn't, I didn't put the number. Did I put the number in the bulletin? Okay, well, because it's not on the screen. Uh, America the Beautiful, I offer to you all this invitation. If there's anybody here who might feel the grace of Jesus Christ and is interested in, uh, in how he or she might respond, talk to me after the service. If there's anybody who has a question or a comment about the, the service, I'm delighted to talk to you about that. I think there's a reception for my birthday downstairs, so you may have to do it down there. Uh, and people be singing happy birthday and stuff like that. But I'll still talk to you about it. Uh, let's all stand and let's close this service by singing America the Beautiful.
I'll tell you, if, if you've got your, your hymn book, and most of y'all are singing from the screen, and that's a good thing, think about that third verse about heroes. Um, wow. I think we need more heroes nowadays. We need more heroes. Uh, with that in mind, brothers and sisters, go now in peace and believe that God intends for you to live in peace. Peace on the inside, peace as you look towards God, and peace as you look towards one another. So let me challenge you to claim it and just see how it shapes your life. And to empower this walk, receive the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And the people said, oh, at 12.01... By the way, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Amen.